I guess, you know, Marsha wanted to do this, so we have to be in the area, and so here we are. Could you explain how it's Sure, I'll do that. Um, uh, we are a website for whistleblowers uh, for black projects, and we also interview uh, contactees and experiencers and uh, authors and uh, researchers. This is probably not important, but just because I deal with whistleblowers. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Um, so I'm going to turn that off. Um, you know, I just always have to chat. Mm -hmm. uh, if you understand whistleblowers, um, so whistleblowers from black projects are just like whistleblowers in any sort of the mainstream, except that they're uh, much more covert, and a lot of them are breaking uh, national security oaths, et cetera. And we're famous for um, doing what is called the guerrilla filmmaking style, just putting a camera in front of somebody. We do, don't do sound bites. We allow them to talk for like two hours at a time. I'm not your usual interviewer, so, um, because <laughs> I, I get a lot of flack. Uh, some people love it, and some people hate it. So my apologies to those of you that hate it. Um, uh, but I, what I do is just, I tend more to delve into and challenge and, you know, um, and, and really go into a subject matter and, and try to bring out the person in ways that they're maybe not accustomed to doing. Because my, uh, the whole mission uh, that Project Camelot is about is to get the truth out. And what happens with whistleblowers and a lot of people that are giving testimony of any kind, there's a lot of programming often that takes place. And so I will occasionally interrupt and ask questions that throw them off track because I tend to get the truth when I do that. And so it's, a, it's an interesting tactic. But um, in this case, Marshall, I've prepared him. <laughs> but um, also, he, he seems to be you know, more or less used to giving the truth as he wants it. So this won't be so jarring for him you know, as it is for sometimes some of my interviews. <coughs> so that's. Hi there, I'm Carrie Cassidy from Project Camelot, and I am here with Marshall V. and Summers. And this is a very impromptu interview uh, done in a live setting because Marshall is up here in Estes Park, Colorado. And I happened to fly into Colorado as well to visit some friends this weekend. And I have a friend who's in attendance here who has sort of uh, arranged this, this to happen. And uh, we happen to be in the area, so I thought, you know, why not? And uh, I, I, I am familiar with Marshall's work. I've read uh, Allies of Humanity, I believe, the first ebook, maybe even the second, I don't know. Yeah. I wrote, read an ebook. Uh, read an ebook, okay. And uh, so I am familiar with uh, a lot of that, and I approve of that message, <laughs> let me say, because it, it does take um, into account some of the philosophies of Project Camelot in general. Uh, and, and I will allow Marshall to, to really go in depth on that subject. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very exciting to be here, uh, it's a beautiful setting here in the Rocky Mountains and um, gorgeous day. I'm excited to, to meet you in person and I'm very interested to hear what you have to say and I will try to give you as little trouble as possible but <laughs> still make life interesting for the next hour. So, um, so hello and, and, and please introduce yourself to the camera uh, for the people that are not familiar with your work if you wouldn't mind. Okay, well my name is Marshall Viad Summers and um, I am presenting what I believe to be an important, what I call greater community awareness and understanding about the people of Earth and our presence in a greater community full of intelligent life and what our emergence into that greater community will mean for us and can mean for us 
both the opportunities and the hazards involved in perhaps the greatest event in human history. And my background really is more as a minister. Uh, I left my work as a special ed teacher for the blind about um, almost 40 years ago, began to teach inner guidance, had a personal revelation in 1982, which confronted me with the voice that had been counseling me both in my inner guidance work and as a special educator. And that had a tremendous impact on altering the course of my life. And since then, I have been receiving a vast body of teachings and insight commentary called The New Message. It's a new message for humanity. And a big part of that has to do with our encounter with this greater community of intelligent life, because that has a lot to do with why we are all here in the world at this time. But we as terrestrial dwellers do not yet have the wisdom, or nor the perspective, nor the insight enough yet to be able to comprehend this greater community sufficiently so that we as the native peoples of the world do not make the kind of critical errors that the native peoples in the past have made regarding their first contacts with explorers from beyond. Okay. Uh, now, just because I'm curious, and I think that the viewer will be as well, you say you had a voice that sort of changed your path mm -hmm. come, come forward. And uh, I assume this is sort of like a contact experience of some kind. Yes. And I'm wondering, could you describe the contact in a little more depth? Certain race uh -huh. of beings, et cetera, et cetera. And is this an ongoing contact? Do you feel that you're communicating with your higher self? Or do you feel that you are actually communicating with a group of beings that are a specific race of beings, for example? OK. Uh, I consider the voice of the voice, the primary voice, to be an angelic voice. And it was this angelic voice that began to speak to me in my work with uh, blind children. Uh, because anyone who works with the handicapped has to be able to develop certain kinds of intuitive skills. Uh, you can't go by the book if you're really going to teach young people how to be independent livers or live independently. And so this voice grew in scope and power for me to such a point that it began to give me curricula to teach. Mm -hmm. And I taught that curriculum and I also studied it. I also made myself the first student of my work always. And this built up to such a point that I had an epiphany of my own because certainly that voice isn't here simply to make you feel comfortable or to make you happy, but to ask you to do something significant and to engage you in serving the world beyond what you had considered to be possible or even preferable before. So this voice experience has grown into a major aspect of my life and certainly the source of my work. And it was this voice that asked me to receive the Allies of Humanity briefings from a, a group of observers, off-planet observers, who were witnessing the extraterrestrial intervention in our world and wanted to provide us wisdom about that intervention to equip us and forearm us and forewarn us of what that could mean for us. Uh, we have a real disadvantage in encountering this greater community. And so the Allies of Humanity briefings are here to impart greater community knowledge and wisdom to us so that we may have this contact experience from a position of power and authority and responsibility. But the angelic voice is the voice of the new message. It's the voice that has pre presented all of my writings, all of my recordings, and now is beginning to reach people in other countries and around the world. So uh, it has been quite an inexplicable journey. So whenever anyone asks me about my life and how did you come into this, I'm always bewildered at how I'm going to answer such a thing. And I, I think you understand this because anyone who is connected uh, beneath the surface of the mind, what you could call the higher self or the deeper self, begins to live a much more inexplicable life. Mm -hmm. And I know many of your readers and viewers understand this and experience this, as do the people who are gathered here today. I, I guess I'm a little confused in terms of when you call it an angelic voice and you say the um, allies of humanity material that you were given. Yes. Did that come from the angelic voice or did it come from another group no. that was then communicating to the angelic voice? Is there some kind of relationship here? Well, yes. Uh, the Allies of Humanity briefings are briefings from an extraterrestrial source. It's an authentic 
off-planet communication that I was asked to receive. And I should mention that when I was asked to receive this, I was very resistant to it. I uh, just did not want to get involved in this arena called the extraterrestrial presence in the world. Hmm. But before, in, in 1996, I was preparing Greater Community Spirituality, which is a very core book to the New Message teachings. And of course, it deals a great deal with the greater community, understanding God at the level of the greater community, understanding our association, our individual association with the universe full of intelligent life, what wisdom means there, the things that we do not yet understand in order to function there responsibly and effectively. And it was this voice that asked me to receive an off-planet source called the Allies of Humanity. And uh, I finally relented because after a while, I mean, freedom is no choice in that sense. And that began the briefings, the transmission of the briefings. The first set of briefings happened in two stages over the course of one year. And the second set of briefings all happened within about um, just a few days. And the third set of briefings, which has not yet been published, uh, most of it was received in one day. And then last February, I received the final chapter to it. And there's a story behind the Allies which is pretty interesting because they're really operating as spies here in service to us because they represent free nations in our region of space. And freedom is rare in the universe, and particularly in our region of space. So we know from our worldly experience that free nations don't get along very well with unfree nations. And there's always a dissonance there in a difficulty. And so we are being, the world is now really being intervened by races who are here to take advantage of this world and of our position in this world. And the Allies' briefings warn us about this, that this is premature contact, that humanity is not ready for contact. We do not have the social cohesion. We do not have the worldly wisdom. We're not prepared for this kind of engagement with races who can be far more clever and effective than we are and who can exert much more control over the mental environment a reality that we're only just beginning to understand. And so the briefings are really here not only to warn us, but to encourage us. Because what I see in the world today is that individuals and groups of individuals are losing confidence, not only in themselves individually, but in human institutions, human leadership. And of course, we all have good reasons to doubt human leadership. But this erosion of confidence in ourselves and one another sets the stage for the kind of intervention that is occurring in the world today, which is not a military intervention. It's an intervention of persuasion and dissonance. And it's manifesting itself in different ways. And so it's very important for us, particularly for people who have a spiritual grounding, who are focused spiritually, because we can make some very critical mistakes in assuming that whatever happens to us is the right thing to happen to us. You've heard these kind of platitudes. Mm -hmm. uh, we're right where we just need to be. Um, God gives us whatever we need. We can handle whatever happens. These are the kind of ideas that can really get us in trouble in engaging with the complexity of life, even it, as it's manifesting in our world today. Okay. Uh, well, very true, very true words. Uh, <clears throat> in terms of the, the, the way the briefings came to you, can you describe how they came to you, like literally the physical way they came to you, and whether or not you say they came sort of through this, uh, this particular race, mm -hmm. or a group of races, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure which, um, and whether or not they manifested to you uh, interdimensionally, physically, or whether you were, you know, you saw them in, you know, however it was for you. Okay, well, uh, because a lot of people have different question. experiences in that way when they Certainly. they get telepathic information from other beings, mm -hmm. other races, um, which may or may not be authentic, right. you know, That's and right. coming from source and so on, so on, so forth. So. Can you describe sort of the nuts and bolts of that? And then we'll get into the context of, okay, of the certainly. material. Well, I, I'll hold this in contrast to the experience of the angelic presence, which is a tremendous presence. In fact, for me, it was so tremendous that when I really was able to face it completely, it had 
a kind of devastating effect on my life. It wasn't a sweet and comforting kind of experience. It was more like being blasted by radiation, and uh, it certainly created a shift in me. And so I hold that kind of experience, which is a tremendous experience of presence, will fill the entire room. You can't think of anything else. You can't do anything else. I mean, it's overwhelming. And if you have not learned to recognize what it is, you might think it is a terrible thing that's happening to you. You might be terrified of it. So I had, I've had a long runway in preparing to receive this kind of presence and to receive this communication. But the allies, I did not meet them personally. They've never visited the planet. They've never been on the planet. And they make it very clear that the real allies of humanity are not here and will not come. And we can talk about why that is so from an ethical and practical standpoint. So the, my experience with allies was like hearing a voice on a very long distance call. No personality, no presence, something far, far away. Because they were far away. I mean, even, even positioned in our solar system discreetly as they were at the beginning, uh, they were still very far away. And so this was a divine connection that is free of mechanical interference and interception. Uh, it is something we don't know how to create. I don't know if anyone knows how to create this. And so there could be no interference from the intervention itself and, and no interception. And But for me, it was a very faint experience compared to the experience of the presence. So no dramatic meetings, uh, didn't get on any spaceships, didn't travel around the galaxy. I didn't do anything like that. And yet the emphasis on my receiving this was so strong. And had that emphasis not been there, I'm sure I would have just dismissed it as an errant kind of experience or an annoyance or, no, I don't want to do that. Uh, but it proved to be very important and I recorded it in my voice and it was transcribed. But when I read the Allies of Humanity Briefings, I know that this is not coming from me. And I think especially notable in the Allies is the regard it has for humanity. A seeming regard that's much greater than I think most of us have for our own selves as a race. I mean, we're, we're a pretty clumsy, violent, and disorganized race uh, collectively. We might be fantastic individually, but collectively we don't make a very good show in our local universe. And uh, the, the allies do uh, comment on that. Uh, but for me, the engagement was very, very subtle. And, but when, it, when I locked into that, it was quite strong. I mean, the words flowed, the feeling flowed, the kind of beyond words you would hear in the communication uh, had real power and efficacy and certainly affected me, affected the people who were the first to listen to these. But it's just my voice. Whereas when you listen to the angelic presence speaking through me, you're hearing a totally different voice. I mean, it has somewhat like my voice because it's using my body as a platform. But that's clearly not me. In fact, uh, we listened to one of the recordings this morning in our conference, which we call the encampment. And I, I listened to that voice and I thought, I wish I could talk like that. <laughs> I really do, and I mean that. I have tried and I can't do it. Uh, you have a 40 minute presentation, it's word perfect. Every sentence is powerful. The inflections are perfect. Um, <laughs> nobody can figure out what the accent is. Um, I, I don't know. You know, all I can say is I yield to that experience and to provide it to others, see if it is valuable for them. So, so I have a couple different directions I want to go, and I know mm -hmm. we have limited time here, so mm -hmm. I'm going to try to do it uh, easily and quickly. But uh, so, in terms of, first of all, we, you know, you heard it as it was a distant telephone call. So. Is it in your head a voice, and then you are sort of taking dictation, writing it down, or or speaking it out? You no, know? I hear it as a voice, and then that voice locks onto my voice, and then I can speak it and record it. Okay, it's way too fast for me to write. I've never been able to write these things down in the speed which they're given. Okay, but you're you're hearing it's like a yeah, sort of you're clear hearing audience. Yeah, you voice. Faint little voice. In fact, before I received the first set of briefings, I was kept up almost an entire weekend. And I didn't really want to accept it by this little voice saying, "Would you please receive us?" 
receive us. Receive us. And this was like a, a ringing in your ear. It was so continual. It's mm -hmm. like a repeating message. And uh, But once I locked into the voice, I could speak it. And my inexplicable training has enabled me to do that. Okay. And once you started uh, speaking what you were hearing, and you're saying, you, you know, you, on the one hand, you, you did this with the angelic presence in a certain mm -hmm. sense, then uh, physically, it, I am assuming it was completely different. Completely different. I couldn't, the contrast couldn't be greater. Okay. No presence, no, uh, no sense of anyone nearby. You're hearing something very, very distant. It's Nothing visual? No, it's like it's coming through a tube. Hmm. Like someone's speaking through a long tube. Okay. And, uh, and that's one of the ways that I knew there was something very different. And that's why at the beginning I was resistant. Because I just didn't want to deal, I don't want to deal with voices I don't know. And particularly if they claim to be off-planet and physical and things like that. Uh, but what they reveal, I think, is pretty remarkable and very clear and very shocking, and not only shocking in terms of what we don't know, but shocking in terms of what we have to might reconsider that we think we already know about the extraterrestrial presence and what it means for our world. I'd love to go down the, you know, some of these paths uh, very deeply, but at this moment, let's talk about what it is they are talking about. What is, what are some of the main premises that they brought forward mm -hmm. for the people that don't know uh, and I know that some people, certainly in the audience, are going to be very familiar with this. Mm -hmm. But if you could delineate out some of that information, certainly. maybe quickly and concisely, and then we can we can go deeper into uh, sort of the nature of some of the things you have more recently uh -huh. gotten. That's good. Uh, first, they want us to know that there are free races actually out in the universe. Um, and that the universe is governed by nature, and no one has been able to overcome nature. Now, this is very important because we think technology has no end, and that it can replace the, all the constraints of nature. And they make it very clear that the more advanced a race is technologically, the greater its need for resources. The more it has to be engaged in complex arenas of trade, the more it has to be uniform and undemocratic. And the more it's actually uh, vulnerable to having access to what it needs from the greater community. And we live in a highly populated part of the universe where there's not a lot of frontier, where there are very strict rules of trade, a great deal of control over territory. Um, it's not the Wild West out there free for our taking. And war has been suppressed in this region of space. Conquest is suppressed. Um, so if you want to gain influence over another world, you have to do it through other means. And the other means have been cultivated to a very high degree. And we're talking about persuasion and deception. Okay. And here we are, the native peoples of the world, thinking that we're in the center of the universe, that if anyone would come to visit us, they would come to help us most naturally because we are so important to the cosmos. <laughs> and, you know, uh, we of course want higher technology because we want power. And we have problems here we can't seem to deal with, global problems, uh, resource depletion, climate change, uh, political corruption, a growing uh, dissonance between nations over who have access to the remaining resources of the world, just one example. And so we feel very needy of help. See what I'm saying? And so the Allies briefings make it very clear that those who are in the world today will present themselves as agents of change and beneficial change for humanity. The world cannot be militarily overtaken because it would destroy its value. None of the races visiting our world can live here because of the biological hazard. So they need human assistance. They need us to use the planet the way they want it used. And they'll even use all of our infrastructure. And the reason that this is new and not ancient is because only 
in the latter part of the 20th century have we created an infrastructure that foreign races can utilize. The native peoples couldn't do anything for them. Okay, well what about the times of Atlantis? The earlier, the world's been visited throughout its history. There have been attempts to colonize the planet. They've all failed because of the biological hazard. And biological hazard is a very big deal in the greater community, and I, we can certainly talk about that if we have any time. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the Allies' intention is to warn us that there are different races of beings here, but they're all part of an intervention. And there are competing groups here in the world. And they're multiracial. So we may see them in different forms, and they can certainly project forms. Uh, I don't mean that mysteriously, I mean that technologically. I mean they can project images into holographically into our environment. And they will use our aspirations, our greed, our corruption, our uncertainty, and our insecurity to build their importance. And certainly, even at this point, they have enough human representatives and apologists in the world that will promote their importance and the idea that humanity cannot make it on its own, that our leaders are incorrigible, that our institutions are too flawed to be redeemed, and that we must have their health and their brilliance and even their spiritual enlightenment in order to redeem ourselves and to take care of our world in the way that we might aspire to. Excuse me. No problem. Well, that is clearly uh, what they want to persuade us of. I understand. Now, what we don't understand is what constrains the intervention. Uh, people say, well, if they want the place, they should just come take it. I mean, if, if they're not taking by force, it means they, they're probably not violent or they're probably not uh, here to harm us in any way. But see, there's so many missing pieces to this puzzle that we can't add that I think the briefings attempt to add in, in the most clearest and lucid manner possible. I mean, uh, you know, your 10-year-old could read The Allies of Humanity and, and get it. Okay, so it doesn't require a highly sophisticated notion of uh, dimensions or dimensionality or uh, spiritual dimension or a political astuteness in order to read The Allies briefings and realize what they're telling you. Is they're telling you you're facing a subtle invasion that is not here to destroy you but to utilize you and will use your strengths and your witnesses and your adaptability to this world, which they do not possess, in order to establish their own agenda here. Their agenda here being yes. uh, that they want resources. They want resources. That they also, but they also, uh, they also want to inhabit this world, it not, appears. They don't really want to inhabit it because they can't. All they can do that is through genetic manipulation. But even genetic manipulation is a very time-consuming and difficult task. Um, and that's why the intervention has taken a very slow pathway. It just happens to be the most effective way to in, ingrain yourself in the consciousness, in the biological reality of another race. Okay, um, and, and at this point you're talking, do you want to talk about the various races that are involved in this uh, sort of co covert invasion? Or, uh, you know, do you want to delineate out some of those races? Because obviously there are many, and we can't, you know, we can't list all, you know, 57 or more, mm -hmm. because those are, you know, some of our, our intel that tells us that at least 57 mm -hmm. races, but, but quite possibly more. That's right. Um, and, do you want to, at least for the, for the listener, uh, beca because I, I know that you're using terminology just in your phrasing, mm -hmm. that if people aren't quick and, and don't already have a background I in see. this, they, sure. might, they might actually have, have misunderstood what you said. Um, because you'll say foreign, and they may think, well, you know, we're in the United States, maybe he means France, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and and okay. I, just because, you know, I catch it, because obviously I'm used to thinking along these lines, mm -hmm. you know. But, but what I'd like you to do is, we're talking about an invasionary force, mm -hmm. because people are very sort of hyped up on the notion that, oh, maybe we'll be invaded mm -hmm. sometime in the future. Mm -hmm. A lot of movies bring that possibility mm -hmm. forward. Certainly. But the fact is, we've been invaded, 
and we're being invaded as we speak by all of these races that you're describing. And um, so let's name some names, uh, if you don't mind, just briefly before we move on. Well, first of all, there are no names given in the Allies' briefings. They do not describe where they're from because they want to protect their Yes, I noticed that. They also do not describe in names the races who are here because it would be meaningless to us or it could certainly generate a lot of fantasy and ex, you know, speculation. Um, what is important to us is to know that those in our world today are resource explorers and they are working beneath the rules or around the rules of engagement that are established in our region of space in order to have access to our world. If it appears to outside observers that their presence here is not resisted or denounced, then they have, within the rules of engagement in our region of space, they can be here without uh, setting off alarms to their competitors or establishing official oversight problems. The official oversight is there's no government ruling the universe, but there are governments ruling trade. And trade rules everything for advanced nations that are interdependent with one another. And that is where the control is, is demonstrated. Advanced intergalactic nations. Intergal yes, intergalactic. Advanced nations. And there's so many things here that, you know, I, whenever I talk about this, I have to kind of paint a picture in the background because uh, the picture is very different than what most people think today. Um, we either think that the off-planet intelligences and races are either very demonic or very angelic. Or we think there are good ones and bad ones. You know, the good guys out there are going to help us, and there are bad guys who are not going to help us. Uh, the briefings themselves kind of set the record straight that in order to create an unambiguous situation on Earth, those potential groups who were visiting at earlier times are not here. Because we don't have the ability to discern. We don't have the subtlety or the insight to discern friend from foe. You cannot tell an ally from an adversary unless you're very skilled in the mental environment. Mm -hmm. Very intuitive, very insightful. Literally a seer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because they're presenting themselves as the saviors of humanity. Mm -hmm. And in the background, they're taking people and never returning them. In the background, they're building a new human. Not to replace us, but to determine our direction. I'm often also asked, and I never like these questions very much, but I'm often asked, you know, as our president and extraterrestrial or as our leaders, I think the thing to understand here, because I've had an opportunity both through the Allies briefings and through the greater community teachings of the new message, which go way, way beyond the Allies themselves, is that those individuals that are being prepared to be in the world are here to advise the leaders. Mm -hmm. They're psychic, they're powerful, they're brilliant. You can recognize them if you have the eyes to see, but most people will not recognize them. Mm -hmm. They're not in positions of leadership, they're unaccountable to the public, you will rarely see them on camera. This is okay, how an intelligent so race gains ability and influence and control without the people knowing it. Certainly, because they don't realize they have somebody to rebel against. That's right. They, they think that they are um, in alignment, mm -hmm. at least those that, that are following that particular That's right. person or group. Um, okay, so so we have also... You know, you made an interesting statement a ways back in which you said that in this area of the, I guess you said the galaxy, mm -hmm. they don't allow, there's a lot of control and they don't allow war. That's right. And what I got was an overt war. Um, and I wish you could talk about that a little mm -hmm. more because that's an interesting statement. And, you know, understanding in, in when I'm talking to you is what I have is a body of knowledge that comes not only from my own intuitive information, but also from the contacts, the whistleblowers, and the people that are, are feeding me information behind the scenes. So I have gotten some descriptions that dovetail, if you will, some yes. of the things that you're saying. Yes. And um, 
you know, too strong a way to put it would be evidence. But I certainly have witness testimony that would maybe substantiate some of the things you're saying. So what I'm trying to do is find out whether or not they reveal themselves or they reveal more about this picture. So, so when you say there, that there's control in this area of the mm -hmm. galaxy, mm -hmm. who's in control? And, and if there's no war, in a sense, we know there's a war. Um, certainly, there's a war spiritually. Oh, very much so. Um, and so, but there are ways that w this so-called war manifests, and, and it sounds like there's limitations in the way the war can manifest in this area of the yes, galaxy. Limitations is a good word. Um, large nations, if they become involved in networks of trade, have great influence over each other. And it's a very competitive environment. Uh, the universe, our universe that we're going to have to deal with, isn't a big frontier with a bunch of uninhabited Earths out there that we can go uh, migrate to when we've just completely used up this one. I mean, And this reality is a very competitive reality. And so the skill in mental environment, the skill in persuasion, the skill of seers, the skill of things that we might hold to be very spiritual but now have been used or are used in a very mundane and even invasive way are used a great deal. I mean, once the rules are established, everyone figures out a way to get around them or to skirt them or to operate within them effectively. And of course, we're the, like the young child that goes into the big city, but we don't know anything about the social reality, the political reality of that metropolis. Uh, and it's our naivete and our innocence uh, that makes us in probably endearing. I think you get this sense of endearment when you read the Allies Brief. They really think we're, we're, we're very sweet, actually. But they also indicate that, you know, some things we don't know that could destroy us. Mm -hmm. And not having any idea of what the reality is behind, beyond our solar system uh, is a tremendous disadvantage. So those forces in the world today uh, are not, you know, operating in a military sense, but they're infusing themselves into the hierarchies of religion, government, and probably even more specifically or more greatly in commerce. Okay, but we do have war on this planet, mm -hmm. and right. it is orchestrated even from behind the scenes by these so-called persuasive uh, contacts or entities or, or, or races, as you call them. Uh -huh. But um, there's also, from what I understand, there's also literal war taking place in the solar system and outside the solar system between some of these races. And yet you're saying there are limitations. So I guess what I'm curious about is, not so much what's allowed on Earth, although mm -hmm. certainly that's, mm -hmm. that's part of the question, but what is allowed in, let's say, what's allowed in our solar system? Because I've gotten information as to certain groups that are actually maintaining what you would, might call, what they call out, outposts mm -hmm. on the edges of our solar system mm -hmm. that either allow some craft in or don't allow some craft in. In other words, kind of maintaining trade routes, if you will. Well, there's supply routes for those who are here, and some. This is the complexity that gets really difficult because uh, different nations have been uh, contacted by different groups, and certainly I'll I'll say a few things that might might shed some light on this. One is, if you want to gain ascendancy in the world, and have your presence be the most trusted presence, then you have to weaken the strongest nations. And one of the ways you weaken a strong nation is by uh, engaging it in intractable conflicts. And then begin to erode the confidence of its people in that nation. This is very much about persuasion and acceptance. Okay. I make this emphasis about war because our whole orientation to space is war. Mm -hmm. Star Trek, Star Wars, War of the Worlds. Right. This is where we're coming from as a people. We think the universe is just another big battleground between empires and freedom fighters and all this kind of stuff, which is a total projection of you know our reality here on Earth. Mm -hmm. But the truth is we're facing a non-human universe. And that alone is enough to send pe give people chills. We're facing a universe that does not value 
human values. But we're also facing a universe that, like every other creature, requires resources to live, has to deal with competition, has to deal with provision, has to coexist with others. So our emergence into the greater community is an emergence into a much more sophisticated and complex environment. And we're going to emerge into this greater community because we can't stop. It's happening. Not because we're going out and finding out what's out there, but because what's out there is coming here. Mm -hmm. Not all of what's out there, but some of it. The briefings also indicate that there are very few worlds in the universe who know of our existence. Because That's an interesting statement. <laughs> those who do know keep it a secret. You are competitors. Or the freedom-loving races certainly don't want anyone to know because the freedom is rare in the universe and you begin to promote the idea that there's this beautiful virgin world down here being despoiled by its native peoples, its stewards, then you're going to have a lot of intervention. You know, it's in the, this is the Ali's briefings talk about this as well as the New Message Greater Community teachings, is that we're following a very, a very normal path of self-destruction. Mm -hmm. that most races that become technologically endowed begin to outstrip their world's resources and are usually engaged in the greater community not because of their explorations but because the greater community arrives offering gifts with the secret plans and that's how the inducement that is the inducement the inducement is not just to be a conquered people because we'd resist and if we resist, they couldn't function here and they destroy the, the value of this world. But if we can submit, and if our desires and our ambitions can be enticed, then that's the best weapon there is, is to make the enemy drop their weapons and join you according to the, to the engagement that you present. Okay, so on a certain level, what you're talking about, because as above, so below. Mm -hmm. So there's a certain level at which I can use certain phrases like being co-opted. So if I'm here on Earth and I have a corporation and I co-opt the opposition mm -hmm. by bringing them on board to my agenda mm -hmm. or even a portion of my agenda and not tell them about my hidden agenda, then I'm co-opting them because yes. they're, you know, if I'm Coca-Cola, I get them to, you know, to, to drink my Coke and, and maybe make a great deal with them. And they're, if they're a lesser power, you know, a lesser powerhouse, corporate speaking mm -hmm. in the world, then they come on board and they think, oh, they got lots of bells and whistles and they get to be my so-called friend. But in reality, that's not really what's going on there, right? That's right. I'm, I'm Coca-Cola and I'm going into Africa and giving them Coke, mm -hmm. free Coke, even whatever, I give a lot of things away, right, initially. Sure. And then they become my friends, and then they let me in, and they let me buy land, they let me build corporations, build, you That's know, right. and then pretty soon I'm employing them, but pretty soon I'm also ruling them because I'm employing them. That's right. And so on and so forth. So That's by right. the same token, if we go off planet, a, a similar thing is going on. We That's bring right. in, uh, they bring in the bells and whistles, which are free energy, um, you know, technology to go off planet. Mm -hmm. The idea of terraforming other planets is very appealing mm -hmm. to a race that is despoiling their own planet, right? Certainly. So, so there we have techniques to go off planet, to make going off planet more easy, and also to, also to uh, inspire them to possibly go to other worlds where they can then create a safe place, especially under the juncture of where we are now at, where this world is not only on a precarious road in terms of of, of being spoiled by by technology, but also by our misuse of technology, but also by earth changes that are that are imminent and and beginning to happen. So that in the in those in that scenario, and and then some of our black projects have, uh, well, what, what it's called, you know, Project Looking Glass, and they have future technologies that can see the future or potential futures that have more potential of happening than other potential futures and then then that gives them the upper hand certain countries on this planet the upper hand so they can conduct business in a certain way to go in alignment mm -hmm. with a positive agenda towards the future that looks like it's more likely going to happen anyway so they're planning for a 
um, you know, for a certain scenario. And the scenario involves earth changes on the one hand. It involves rolling out a sort of population elimination agenda on another. And then also a sort of this resources um, trading establishments with various races off planet to where these alliances have been made and built and, and kept up with the promise of greater benefits for the future, whether it be China's dealing with one race and, and told they're going to get benefits in the future of this, that, and the other, and ultimately they'll be the new rulers of this earth if they do play, play ball. And then you get the United States, who's had alliances with various other groups for a while, who has been told the same thing. And then you pit the two countries against each other so that they're always in a little bit diminished state or state of her sort of semi-hysteria, or at least their militaries are, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. So, so it's, it's easy to, like, like um, causing dissension on a, in a playground between two bullies. If you get the bullies fighting with each other, they're not going to really be watching what you're doing anyway. And you're over here sort of taking their gold and telling them, you know, it's a good thing for you because you're going to back them in the future and all that kind of thing, right? I think you begin to get the gist. Uh, <laughs> this is a very, it's a very, very well, no, but it's very well said. And um, we're, you know, even today, even in the world, with, even without an extraterrestrial presence here, I mean, we're, starting to learn about the power of influence. Um, you know, this is not, uh, in most places in the world, this is not gunboat diplomacy anymore. This is about dependence. A nation becomes dependent upon what you purchase from them or provide them, then without changing their flag or their language, you begin to determine the course of their destiny. Mm -hmm. You don't really want to occupy them because that is way too expensive and difficult. You don't want them to resist you because that's way too difficult. Um, and this is beginning to give us a picture of how nations influence one another in a greater community where the level of sophistication is much, much higher and where the psychic abilities are much higher. So I always want to take this into a larger arena of life and also I hope we have time to talk about what the connection is to our core spirituality because uh, okay. we are in the world today for a purpose, each of us. We're here to be in a time of transition and danger in the world. You know, the greater community, uh, certainly many people are, feel connected to it anyway for reasons that they probably can't explain very well. Uh, and it's certainly going to be part of our collective and individual destiny. The fact that it's still, you know, barred from the social discourse doesn't diminish the fact that it's centrally important to our future and to uh, what kind of world we're going to have. But it's very muddy water. And even the truth has been so sullied. I gave a presentation in Denver about 10 years ago to a group there. And a young man came out and he said to me afterwards, he said, you know, there hasn't been anything clean about the extraterrestrial presence for 25 years. And so, you know, we, we have to look now at what our relationship with this greater community is, our relationship with this intervention. I mean, the uni not the whole universe is intervening here. I mean, these, we're just part of a larger environment, and we've come of age. Mm -hmm. We've reached puberty technologically, mm -hmm. okay? We're now subject to greater interests, and we're also destroying the planet, the wealth of the planet, the wealth that others would value. It's biological wealth. When I say resources, I'm not talking about, you know, uh, uh, coal seams. I'm not talking about the kinds of things that we think are really important. I'm talking about biological elements in a universe of barren worlds. I'm talking about blood. I'm talking about plasma. I'm talking about cellulose. I'm talking about the building blocks of life. This is precious stuff. The recent Allies briefings say, you have no idea how important a tree is. So it's really important for us to begin to get a more greater community perspective, if that's possible, than simply projecting all of our values out onto space, uh, which will never really inform us of what we're dealing with. And that's what I think the Allies briefings, the greater community teachings of the new message, give us an opportunity to step out of this and to see the universe in a more prosaic manner 
not a multi-dimensional, not a, not in a way that, you know, is is extremely subtle, but in a way that's manifest. Because we have to deal with the manifest reality before we can deal with the subtle reality. You know, if we're running out of money, or if we've got a tumor in our side, right? Or if we just lost our house, that's a lot more important than our meditation practice for that day. And so it's the manifest reality we have to begin to get a handle on. And that's not as complex, I don't feel as complex, or as mystical, because this is level confusion. Level confusion is a real problem here, because there are different levels. Mm -hmm. And the levels present different kinds of things to us. But if we miss the fundamental level, that we're the native peoples of the world, encountering resource explorers that we know nothing about, whose intentions are never revealed, whose activities are surreptitious, whose impact upon people is generally destructive and manipulative, then we have to deal with it at that level primarily if we're going to be a free race in the future. If we can't deal with it at that level, if we get lost in the dimensionality of this whole phenomenon, which is big, uh, we're going to sell the world away or give it away. And we're going to do that. It won't be taken from us. Okay. That's the, and that's the difference. You see, this is where human responsibility or ability to respond becomes critical. And in the New Message teachings, one of the important things about greater community spirituality, spirituality of the universe, is this reality of knowledge. Because, and I'm going to use this word in a different way. I'm not talking about information or book learning or, you know, what we learn in high school or the university. I'm going to talk about knowledge as a deeper mind. You can call it higher self, Christ self, Buddha self, whatever. This mind operates beneath the surface of our worldly mind, our intellect, which is pretty much totally conditioned. I mean, you're never going to totally recondition your personal mind. I mean, it is thinking how culture thinks. It is thinking according to our biological and social realities. Um, it can think better, and it can be valuable, but it is very, very ingrained. Excuse me. Knowledge is really important here because it's the only part of us that cannot be manipulated. Okay. And I want to take knowledge out of the religious realm, if I can, or the spirit, high spiritual realm, because there's so many things associated with it, and bring it down into a kind of a, a consciousness baseline. This is, this is the well of what you know and can know mm -hmm. and your ability to know. Mm -hmm. This is the part of you that's still connected to God. Mm -hmm. Not the part of you that's living a, a soul journeying through manifest reality. This is the part of you that didn't leave. It isn't journeying through manifest reality, or it's going with you, but it's not on that journey. Mm -hmm. This is the only part of us that cannot be manipulated by any worldly, extraterrestrial, interdimensional, anything. And this is important because this is the source of our strength and our integrity and our ability to see. If that is not, if that does not become the emphasis of an evolving humanity, then we will we will be seduced in mass. And we'll be seduced in a way we never thought we'd be seduced. And how we'll be seduced is being offered what we want, which is the most deceptive form of seduction there is. Beauty, wealth, and power is part of that, certainly. Um, and we're very primed for it. I mean, as the world becomes more disorderly, as resource depletion continues, as nations become more fractious with one another. And we're entirely able to make our own war, by the way. You don't need any help from beyond to do that. We've been, we're very good at that. We've been doing that for a long time. And nobody has to teach us anything about that. Um, but the wars that we become engaged with, particularly in larger powers, do have a purpose for the intervention. If the only nations that could really rally the world are weakened sufficiently, through intractable conflicts. Mm -hmm. And if the two, two or three strongest nations in the world are repitched in opposition to each other, or that's fortified, there will never be a consensus here. And that doesn't take as much intervention as you might think. Because everything that happens that we do is a result of our decision making. Mm -hmm. And what influences our decision making is what informs our decisions. 
And this is where the power of knowledge becomes centrally important. And this is where spirituality isn't just a wondrous place to be or a place to escape into or a coping mechanism for dealing with a harsh and incomprehensible world, but becomes the traction for really being powerful here and insightful and beyond, percept beyond persuasion. And this is the part of us, amongst other things we have to develop, that's very core to our success, in my view. The Ali's briefings talk about this. Uh, the power of knowledge, the greatest power in the universe, and the intervention's not using it or they wouldn't be here. Um, at that level, you can see this clearly. This is not a mystery. I've gone to conferences and said, this is not a mystery. And everyone's like, what? Because keeping it a mystery is part of the deception. Mm -hmm. We're going to keep this so inexplicable and we'll never get it and it's magnificent. It keeps the adventure going. Mm -hmm. Like this is an adventure in consciousness. Mm -hmm. Study these things. That's one line of thought. So when I've gone to speak to groups of people and presented the Allies briefings in as gentle and compassionate way I can, I mean, the resistance is tremendous because it's like I'm taking people as a parade away from them. I'm taking their lollipop away from them. I'm depriving them of this really exciting thing that's going on and turning it into just another damn thing we have to deal with in life. <laughs> and okay. <laughs> At that moment, I'm going to stop you so we can change tapes. <laughs> I'd like to talk a little about God because God is a part of this. And we are spiritual beings with a spiritual origin and spiritual destiny. And I think our spirituality is actually one of the core strengths of humanity in the universe of highly technological and secular worlds, which predominate in our region of space. Um, we do not need to look for other races to spiritually enlighten us. Uh, we actually have the materials to do that ourselves and have actually done fairly well in keeping the mystery alive here, uh, where it's died in many, many other places. When I talk about God, I'm not talking about our various belief system in, in ultimate power. And of course, whenever the word God is mentioned, people run into all their dissonance about religion and moral issues about religion and organ, organized religion and so forth. Except to say that the thing that is going to enable humanity to enter into this greater community as a free and self-determined race is going to have a lot to do with our spirituality. And I don't mean our spiritual belief or the subtleties of our spirituality, I'm talking about the part of us that is connected to it firmly and immutably. Because if that's the only part of us that cannot be manipulated by any worldly or otherworldly force, then that represents the source of our wisdom, our strength, and our unity with each other. Because in facing the intervention in the greater community, we are certainly facing an adversity that we're unaccustomed to and do not really know how to discern very well. And I don't think anyone in government really knows how to discern it either. I don't think there's, there's a secret group that's got all the cards on the table. And they're on being influenced as well. So it comes down to what people see and know and their responsibility within themselves and to others. Because this is what enables the native race to rally and to begin to question, at least question at the outset, the meaning and the value of this. If we're hungry for technology from beyond the world, which is part of the inducement, it's liquor for the natives, for sure. If we are, we want others to come and rescue us, that will be accommodated. If we want an overseer in the world that's non-human, that will be provided. <laughs> but it's really we have to grow up and become responsible. We're going to enter this greater community. You can't have a nation full of run by tribal conflict and warring nations. And so in adversity here is the opportunity. And the opportunity is the intervention is the one the intervention and the breakdown of environmental stability in the world are the two things that can prompt humanity to unite in its own defense. It it has to be that powerful to overcome our attitudes, our beliefs, our history between nations, the contention between religions, uh, all the things that fracture us and are fracturing us further and further and further, most of which we're doing on our own. 
the intervention can step back and just let us degrade ourselves down. They'll help us do that in certain ways. But I mean, we're doing a pretty good job, even if we didn't get any assistance. The opportunity here is really that the humanity has to unite to be in the greater community. There are three requirements for freedom in the universe. Self-sufficiency, unity, and discretion. Now, we're clearly losing our self-sufficiency at an alarming rate. And we're spending tomorrow's inheritance like there was no inheritance. We're selling our children out, frankly. We're going to use up everything as fast as possible, always thinking that the well will never go dry. And the world is going to reshape itself to assist us in that as we degrade the planet and change its natural balances, which have enabled the rise of human civilization. Those balances, if they become imbalances, can reverse that process. We have to become united, not that we're all clones of each other, or we all live under one flag, but the cooperation is, you know, united we survive, the greater community, divided we fail to it, we fall to it, eventually. And the third is um, discretion. We're broadcasting out into space our wars, our foolishness, our comedies, our tragedies, everything. Discreet observer may never understand our nature, but they can certainly understand our tendencies and behavior. That will have to stop. Free nations do not broadcast, except to each other in ways that are very safely encoded. The price of freedom in the universe is unity, self-sufficiency, and discretion. If we require other nations to provide our core resources here, human freedom will be lost. I don't care what your political persuasion is, what country you come from, what your religious belief is, what inner voices you listen to. It's, that's the name of the game. OK. Uh, you know, that's very interesting. I, I, I'm not sure, you know, the last one, discretion, I, I would say discernment. But I'm, I, you know, I, in a certain sense, I think you're using it on a, in a some more active verb. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I, I would include discernment in that. But certainly right. discernment has to lead to discretion. Right. Yes. So, so it's sort of the outside, the last point of <laughs> uh, station to, before action or as part of action. But so what you're saying, though, is, uh, is, it, is very interesting in the sense that you know, and I don't want to make light of it, but you know the Ronald Reagan saying of you know at some point that if we had a common enemy, we would that would, in theory, unite us. Mm -hmm. um, now, I'm not sure that he meant it in in quite the same way you do. Yes. Um, and right. and I think that people listening to this, who are skeptics and who may be uh, less, um, uh, sort of willing to accept any of your message, might sort of look at that statement in that way. So is there a way that you can address that in, in the sense that if you're talking to the people that, that sort of love to go off on that Ronald Reagan quote, right. yes. uh, what would you say? Well, I first would say that people are terrified of human unity. I mean, I've spoken uh, to conspiracy groups uh, before, and you know, human unity is just a big flag. It's a red flag. Uh, when I talk about unity, I'm talking about responsible management of the planet and cessation of human conflict. Not just purely for moral or ethical reasons, but for really practical reasons. I mean, we're going to have to protect the arable land of the world. We're going to have to protect fresh water and renew fresh water. We're going to have to do all this stuff, or we are, you know, we're not going to have a future, or not a desirable one, certainly. And that is part of the reason the intervention's here. The other part of the reason the intervention's here is we're at the threshold of becoming technologically powerful enough to discern it effectively and to communicate out of the space that we don't want anyone messing with us. Stay away, please. We're not ready. We'll let you know when we're ready. That's why the real allies of humanity or races that could become the allies of humanity are not interfering in the world today because it's highly unethical for them to do that. Even if they wanted to help us grow and become peaceful and peace-loving, they would have to control us to do that. 
Or they would just send their wisdom, like in the Allies briefings. They just send their wisdom. They're not sending, you know, uh, advisors down here to encourage us, persuade us. See what I'm saying? There's a big difference between sharing wisdom with somebody and beginning to control their life or trying to control the life or the outcome. Um, I don't consider the intervention to be evil. I think it's just self-interest in the universe. Mm -hmm. And we have things they need, and they really need them. So there's a lot of myths here that have to be blown up uh, about you know self-sufficiency and free energy, which is a total myth, by the way, by my view. I mean, there's no free lunch in the universe. And even if you could harness free energy, like harnessing the power of the sun, you're going to have to create some pretty powerful technology to do it on a big scale. Mm -hmm. So you still need resources. Right. Right. So even if the energy is free, in order to capture it and use it, you still need huge infrastructure, lots of resources, all these kinds of things. So it's not really free. See what I mean? Sure. You know, it's not really free. But I want to go back to God because whether people believe in God, it's important that they know that there's a part of them that cannot be corrupted and has never been corrupted and that there's a way that that part of them can speak to them and advise them. And this is, you can call it your, your ground of being, your gut feeling, um, whatever you might call it within a religious or a, or a general vernacular. There's a part of us that has to advise us. You know, well, can, or you could say to the intervention, can't you just see this for what it is? 50 years of UFO research can't see it for what it is. Why is that? 50 years of UFO research cannot see this. Oh, we know we're being visited. Sure. We knew that 50 years ago. Haven't gotten any further, really. We've got lots of sightings, We've got drawings, radar, and tons of speculation, and lots of kind of science, pseudoscience, all kinds. But can anyone say, what is this? Well, we're talking about the agenda of the so called invaders, right. you know. Um, but. But what I, I'd like to get back to this idea of what you're talking about, which is sort of humanity's core essence, if mm -hmm. you will, mm -hmm. um, which might be the terminology I would use. But on the other hand, you, I also noted that a little bit a while ago, you, you related to a soul mm -hmm. as not being the same thing as this, en this essence that you're speaking about. And I think that's an important thing to address because I think there will be spiritual people out there Certainly. that will be concerned at that distinction. That's right. Well, in the way that my understanding has evolved and what's been presented to me over these many years is that don't usually use the word soul very much. Um, I describe it more as, as a part of us that's still connected to God um, that's very wise and looks on everything with much greater discernment and depth there's a part of us that is disconnected from God. And we live in the part most of the time that is disconnected. Mm -hmm. And that's almost the price of being in the world. Because if you really had full God awareness, you either wouldn't want to be here. It was way too dissonant. Uh, or you'd have to be here on a major mission and uh, you'd garner a lot of resistance. And that, in that sense, that's enough if you know that a part of you is wise and a part of you is not wise. And you can distinguish that on, a, on an increasing basis in your own experience. Then whatever your religious affiliation or belief or ideology might be, you can relate to this. I mean, people know what I'm talking about. You know, when I've gone to foreign countries and talked about the intervention, oh, you know, no problem getting that. Hey, we've been intervened with for centuries. We're being manipulated right now. I mean, there's, there's no pretense of freedom and democracy and, you know, we're, nobody can affect us because, you know, we're God's chosen race and the people know exactly what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just from a different source. Oh, okay. Yeah, I can get that. Sure. And so it's this ability to see, recognize, and know things that's going to be very key. And it's, you know, it's under the radar of the intellectual uh, d conversation and, um, and in my view, it ends up in the final hour being the most important thing. Because we're never going to fully understand the intervention and how it works. We're never, we might finally figure out its impact on our governments and the way they behave, which I think a lot is being done there. I think on, on our end of the spectrum, we're putting a lot of things together. 
and that's your work, and it's very laudable work. It's very important work, uh, <clears throat> because that's the part of us that's going to capitulate first. You know, and I want to say one more thing about that, if we have time. Um, one of the arguments for intervention is that intervention threatens our economic interests. And therefore, um, our economic interests, you want to thwart intervention. But it's really the opposite. Our economic interests are to be the first to be persuaded. If you can give power no one else has, one little piece of technology which may be a trinket in the universe, if that gives you supremacy in your world, your business world, your life, oh boy. There's, that's unbridled greed right there. You well, know, I so mean, there is, in my work, though, yeah. these, these, these groups have been bought off in that way. In other words, that's a done deal. They have sold their souls in that regard. So what we're talking about is now that they've done that, and they've done it on our, in our name, so mm -hmm. to speak, whether it be the U.S. government or Chinese governments, governments have made deals with the visitors, okay, for these trinkets, as you call them. So knowing that it's been done, now what? Well, I don't think it's a done deal because there are elements in our government. This is what the Allies talk about. They don't really talk about our government because they don't really know much about our government, except that we transmit everything. Even the government transmissions can be, somebody could sit out there and read just our entire script, you know what I'm saying? Um, there are factions within our government that are aware of the intervention to support it, and there are factions that resist it. Oh, right. So sure. this becomes very complex. I mean, when we talk about they've all been bought off, no. Has the government's all been bought off? No. The situation is much more fluid than that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or it is a done deal. And we're just, you know, we're just under, underlings that are it. just going to complain and revolt and, you know, make a lot of noise and nothing's going to happen. The situation, the outcome has not been determined. Okay. And this is very important. Otherwise, you're really going to disempower people. Mm -hmm. And in the situa it's a very complex situation because we're talking about influence uh, permeating lots of parts of our life and in ways that we can are beginning to understand. The other part of this equation is the intervention itself. What guides it, what restrains it, what it can and cannot do, how it has to behave here because it's being watched by other nations. And so if it appears, like I said before, if it appears that we are tolerating, at least tolerating its presence, if it appears that we're accepting and benefiting its presence, then it looks like we are granting them permission to do whatever they want to do here. If that's the appearance, again, this is okay, the problem. Okay, but there's a lot of that going on. Yes. So whether we can say, you know, we could give percentages and so on and so forth. But, but the issue that I'm kind of trying to get to is that if we have a faction, and, and we're certainly aware of white, what we call white hats in the government around the world, who are not willing to cede sovereignty, mm -hmm. whether it be of nations or individuals, mm -hmm. to these visitors, whoever they are, regardless. Mm -hmm. um, then at that point we have, in a sense, allies of humanity in our governments and, and in, in the powers that, that be, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And so given that, that we have that, then what is the next step? Because, you know, there's, there's a level at which individuals cede their uh, freedoms, mm -hmm. okay, and that has to do with how they interact with visiting races, and then also with governments and so on. Mm -hmm. And then there's a level at which governments cede their rights and, and so on. Mm -hmm. So at what point um, do they pull back, and how do they pull back? Because you're saying, in other words, if it's allowed, on a certain level, or tolerated, as you put it, then they proceed. So how do they say stop? And what, what is the terminology, what is the means, what are the methods in which individuals or governments or representatives of governments say to these beings, say to these invaders, stop? Or, or how does it communicate it to stop? I mean, if there is appearance of resistance here, opposition and resistance, that's powerful. Even if it comes from, you know, the public, mm -hmm. see what I'm saying? Uh, we don't know who's a white hat and who isn't a white hat in the government, and certain people certainly are, you can suspect in other ways, but it's what are we going to do? Right. What are you going to do in your position? You have influence and can present many things to many people. What can I do? What can the people in this room do? What can mm -hmm. anybody do? I mean, the first thing I think we have to do 
is begin to recognize this reality is occurring and we have responsibility to deal with it. If we think it's all going to be our government that's going to negotiate the outcome, we've already seceded our personal responsibility, regardless of the makeup of the government. I mean, the government uh, may be more deluded than we are and much more that's influenced. That's very likely. And so, <laughs> my very um, view. But. And that is, it's really, this is a real power to the people kind of message, you see. Mm -hmm. And. I mean, even if you broadcast a shortwave out in the universe, you know, we don't want intervention. We don't welcome intervention. You know, anything, any, any demonstration of resistance. You know, I've gone, I've been invited to speak at conferences, and I'll go to these conferences, I'm the only person who questions the extraterrestrial motivation. Everyone else is completely sold on this. It's groovy, at least some of them are good. And we're going to get into this because this is really exciting, and boy, we're going to get so much good stuff from these people. But we know as human beings that if you want something from someone, you can never discern them. You want something from the intervention? You've already given your power away. Mm -hmm. You're, you're going to be blind mm -hmm. because of what you want. Sure. Or what you think you need or what you think only they can give you. And what can they give us? They're not going to give us real technology. We turn into weaponry and probably you know, destroy the infrastructure of the world. They're not going to give us spiritual wisdom or we wouldn't want intervention. They're not going to give us, you know, uh, high integrity because if we had high integrity, we'd realize we're being messed with and we want everyone out of here. We'll all go home, please. We're not ready for you. We'll let you know when we're ready. When we establish our own rules of engagement in this planet and our own ethics of contact, then we will see who, we, who amongst we want to communicate with. That's become a position of power and authority. Listen, the Japanese kept the Europeans out for 200 years. And how they did it was they burned every ship that entered their region. Not very nice. But the message was got pretty clear. And after a while, the ships stopped coming, right? So you know, if the Native Americans had done that in the United States, we might have a different nation today. We, the white people would be the minority. At a certain place, Someone could say to you that if we're if we are where we where you say we are, you know, what if I said to you that we are ready? Okay. What if I said to you that that, that the information that I've gotten as Project Camelot is that consciousness on the planet is higher than is given credit for, going along the lines which you even mm -hmm. even are saying, which the Allied uh, briefings briefings as you call them say. And, and this is something I talk about when I go out and speak to, to groups, mm -hmm. which is the amazing powers and that are that reside in humanity that we don't give ourselves credit for. Yes. The amazing riches and and skills and um, gifts that each and every person bring to the equation That's here right. on Earth, and that actually even superpowers are within our grasp. In other words, that this human an encasement, whatever you want to call it, is is perfectly conceivable for us because of our amazing potential genetically, as a genetic library, have all the skills embedded in our DNA that all the races that visit here have. In other words, they don't have something that we lack. We do have access to those things within ourselves. It's just that we don't know it. We don't develop right. it. Um, but at this moment, I also think we are on the verge of, if you want to call you know, I would not say, as Jack Nicholson says, you know, you can't handle the truth. Actually, I say we can. And actually, speaking for this, you know, humanity here, mm -hmm. I say there is a huge contingent, in my view. They write to us every day. Now, maybe I'm overly optimistic, but I feel that consciousness is at a place where they are ready. And so, just to wrap up, what would you say to them? And I think some of your your advice or, or the allies' advice in a certain sense, if you want to call it advice, mm -hmm. is, um, is very pertinent. Because if we are on the verge and we are ready, then what's the next step? I would say that we can be ready and we're not quite ready. We have, as you mentioned, we have the resources to be ready. We know more about this planet than any other race in the universe. We're the only race in the universe who could survive here successfully without a great deal of adaptation. Uh, we know more about our nature than any other race in the universe. 
We know more about our history and our tendencies than anyone else in the universe. And that if other nations want to help us, they should share us their wisdom about what life is really like and the pitfalls and dangers of being of functioning in the greater community. So my emphasis through all of my work is to empower people to be strong, effective, and compassionate. And but we're going to need strength. I, I put that first because you can't be messing around in the face of the greater community. This is big time life. And we're still, you know, we're still in a very adolescent phase collectively as a race. I mean, we're mm -hmm. still very indulgent and foolish and we don't, we're not responsible to the future. You know, we're not, we're not saving resources for the third generation out. I mean, we're using up everything. So uh, I think the change in that is a change, not just a change of understanding, but a change of heart to realize we are the stewards of this planet. If we want to continue to be the stewards of this planet, individually we're going to have to learn some new things and we're going to have to become really strong and honest and effective in our lives. And this is about individuals now. This is not about going to change the government. I think that's pretty hopeless at, at, as the first step. Uh, we're not going to get them to divulge their information because if they ever do, it probably wouldn't be whole or complete anyway. And so, but we do need to learn about the greater community itself. We do need to learn about our personal strengths and responsibilities. We certainly all have to get our own house in order, personally, individually. And that's kind of the, you know, that's a great starting place, of course. But, you know, humanity can never give up. And the intervention is either here to win us over or discourage us from resisting. Mm -hmm. That's the power of persuasion. And I look around, I see, you know, many people are on a downward spiral. They're losing heart, they're losing faith, they don't know how to handle their life. They're getting very discouraged by what they see in the world around them. Um, their own sense of inadequacy can overtake them. So, you know, you have to build the person up. If you want to take them into a battle of who's going to control this world in the future. And this is a battle at another level, all right? Mm -hmm. This is like warfare at another level. Okay, we're not going to be clubbing each other over the head. <laughs> but we are, we are going to be determining, you know, what has power and meaning in the world. And that's why, you know, in my work, we present the steps to knowledge. It's available online. You can go read the Allies of Humanity at allieshumanity.org. Go to newmessage.org and study steps to knowledge. Putting tremendous things available so we can reach people not only in the Western nations but all around the world. And uh, something like 60% of the planet has access uh, to cell phones now. You know, it's just, it's amazing. And so that, that education orientation has to happen because no one on earth is going to win if an intervention is successful here. There are no winners amongst us. The profiteers will be subjugated just like the rest of us in a controlled world. And, you know, we're rich or poor, whatever our race, nationality, you know, we're in this together. This is our world. And we're going to have to really re-earn the right to have it be our world. We're going to have to clean it up. We're going to have to build kind of networks of cooperation even just to do that. So I'm talking about something very expansive, very complex. But the incentive has to be there. And the incentive isn't just for wonderful things. The incentive is also the fear of failure. Because we can fail. And there's nothing wrong with being aware of that. We don't have to be terrified of the world to be aware of that. That's just a reality that we know we can fail. And if we understand that correctly without denigrating ourselves, then we know we have the power to rise to occasions. And certainly there could be no greater occasion than this. Thank you. Thank you, Marshall V. and Summers. And I, I really appreciate it. What I'd like you to do is just give out perhaps uh, your, your URL okay. for the people listening and um, any attending knowledge that that they need in order to find your work and, and to pursue it further. Good, thank you for that. Uh, the Allies of Humanity briefings are at alliesofhumanity.org. We're a nonprofit organization. And the first Allies set of briefings is up there for everyone to read. It's also available in ebook now. And uh, the second Allies briefing is in print. The third Allies briefing we hope to publish next year. Uh, one of the seminal works on the greater community for us is called Life in the Universe, which we plan to. Uh, published next year through New Knowledge Library, and we'll send out announcements and so forth. Our main website is newmessage.org, and there you can receive much of the New Message teaching is available online, both in audio, the original voice of Revelation, what people can hear, 
That's the voice that spoke to me that was recorded. You can hear that. As well as, we made a tremendous amount of things available to people. As well as elements for study and application, um, greater community education, all these kinds of things. We really want people to have access to this. And we welcome your participation. Um, there is the, the um, Declaration of Human Sovereignty, uh, which is a document modeled after the Declaration of Independence. It's kind of a, a, a statement indi indicating to the universe our will as the people of Earth, our sense, our rights, we establish our rights, we establish the fact that we are being interfered with and we do not hold that to be appropriate, and the, the kind of engagement we would like to have with other nations uh, who are interested in us. And that's a very powerful document, and I think you know, there's already minds working on this. This is, you know, we may think we're alone, we have a small group, or maybe we're all alone as an individual, and we're trying to put all this together. But there is a groundswell around this. And there is a greater community awareness that's growing. And that awareness really has to be wise and efficacious. And that's why I invite people to explore these materials. And thank you again. OK, well, thank you very much. Now, I'm going to ask you one question that's going to open a whole can of worms. But I, I'm going to do it anyway right at the end, sort of mm -hmm. a, a addendum. Because I, I realize that if I don't ask you, people are going to say, Oh my God, you didn't deal with this subject. So, Earth Changes. And you have a video out that's fairly recent that mm -hmm. I saw. I'm not sure if I saw the whole thing. I saw part of it. Um, and you're addressing some of the imminent Earth changes mm -hmm. that are going to be happening. And specifically, you were addressing even this fall. Mm -hmm. And so this is a timely interview. Yes. Uh, we're dealing with some some possibly imminent earth changes as I speak. Today is uh, September 11th, 2011. Uh, sort of an uh, auspicious day, this perhaps, auspicious day. by some people's estimation. Uh, there's potentially Elenin, there's potentially Nibiru and or uh, the brown dwarf incoming to our solar system. Not sure where you stand on those, those topics. Mm -hmm. But basically, what did you, what can you say Briefly, with honoring the fact that that you do have it, you know, have have some issues with the the length we've been going and so on. Just uh, briefly, could you address what you think might be imminent and why? Well, I'll I'll deal with the prosaic first, and uh, the things that we can all touch upon is the fact that food, water, and energy are declining resources in the world, and will be increasingly so. And those things which seem the most ordinary kinds of things may in the end prove the most difficult for us. Certainly, uh, earthquake activity is increasing. Volcanic activity seems to be increasing, from my understanding. And, um, but I think the thing that's going to create tension between nations and in communities and within our own personal lives is going to be really the fundamentals. And the fact that when you look out on these beautiful mountains here, and I don't know if your camera can take any of that in, you're going to look at a dying forest. That's a dying forest out there, beginning to die. Mm -hmm. That's because the planetary climate has changed only one degree Fahrenheit. That is enough to unleash forces that I'm not sure anyone could foresee, uh, maybe if people did foresee that, that in the western United States alone, we've lost 40 million acres of trees from a very slight variation in our climate alone. That and the availability of water, clean water, the growing aridity of the world, particularly in highly populated areas such as Africa, the Sahel, the Middle East, Southeast Asia is having a critical water problem. These are earth changes that should, are really, these are big things. This is a four alarm fire, actually. The other background things of increasing volcanic or uh, seismic activity is, is going to have its impact as well. And I know there are other people who feel there are celestial forces that are increasing the frequency or the pitch of this, and I do not want to comment on that. I don't feel I really know enough about that to comment on that respectfully. But clearly, the, the pitch of the world, the intensity of things, is escalating. Mm -hmm. And even if you come to a beautiful place, like in the Rocky Mountains here, you can feel that escalation. I mean, young people are committing suicide and, you know, capitulating into drugs like never before. I mean, people, this isn't just uplifting people. This is also wearing us down. The pitch, the intensity, not just of more activity, but the actual intensity of the mental environment. 
and it's really something. And to keep your head in all this, you have to become very strong, very grounded in knowledge, and very appreciative of the greater powers who are here to assist us beyond the visual range. And I think that, you know, we have to accept that we're entering into a new world. We crossed some invisible boundary that said, oh, now we're in a new world. And this isn't going to be like the world of our parents or our grandparents. I mean, we're, we're entering a world of environmental shift. And we've never really, we've dealt with that, you know, on a national or tribal level in big ways through history, but not on a global level. And that is going to change the landscape so dramatically. It could change our whole idea of religion, it could change certainly our governments and their functionality. It will be a great incentive to war, even without foreign persuasion, as a growing number of people attempt to drink from a slowly shrinking well. And the only way that you can prevent chaos and decline is by a growing sense of unity and compassion and awareness that we're in this lifeboat together, this lifeboat called Earth. Thank you. Thank you. You're good. <laughs> Wonderful.